It is definitely weird speaking to a camera, but let's begin. Hello. Um, I, I've stumbled upon this research, um, I would say, without no intention on actually researching the following thing, which I'll present. Actually, I was researching uh, the field of religious responses concerning concentration camp prisoners. I've read the diaries and story collections written by several rabbis. And I, I wanted to complement that with several oral testimonies of observant Jews, which weren't formal figures. And what I've noticed was that it cannot complement the rest of my research because I needed new categories in order to see what it actually meant, not only for rabbis, but also for simple observant Jews, uh, what the search for the divine meant for them, what being an observant Jew in the camps meant for them was fundamentally different. That's what I will try to show. In order to unpack that question, I have set three follow-up questions. Currently in, in research, we have to ask a question of the who in the search of the divine. What resource do we use? And mainly what I've noticed is that most of the resources used when describing what it means to be a religious Jew in the Holocaust, what it means to be an observant Jew in the concentration camp, most of those materials were derived from formal rabbinical texts. Furthermore, what does the search of the divine mean? That was the conclusions of what does it mean were derived from, from those specific texts, again, from formal texts. And therefore they do not display the broader uh, meanings of, of Jewish observance in those camps. And how was this search understood in historiography, the direction it took due to the concentration on more formal texts. And along this lecture, I will present the value of what you see in the fourth question, what can we discover from introducing additional informal resources? That being said, I want to demonstrate the trajectory of the following lecture. I'll begin with about five minutes discussing historiography, what has been done in research, how do we currently understand that those acts of religious observance despite the conditions. Thereafter, I will address one of the leading paradigms, which I call the continuity paradigm, which explains why, despite those conditions, did those observant Jews try to maintain their tradition. Thereafter, I'll revise that paradigm using the oral testimonies, and at the end, I'll provide several patterns of how camp prisoners had interpreted what I had defined as the search of the divine. Generally, in historiography, we ask uh, uh, um, four important questions. What are the main resources? What are the conclusions? What were the topics? And what was emphasized or marginalized? In our case, the specific questions are to what degree is contemporary research based on testimonies given by form of rabbinical figures? And the other side is that what can we learn from introducing and expanding the research to the oral testimonies? Now, let me be very clear. The amount of resources given about this situation of Jews praying, of Jews uh, uh, um, having Jewish rituals in concentration camps, the stories we have from rabbinical texts are far less than what we have from oral testimonies. There are at least 15,000 oral testimonies that in so, to some degree deal with Jewish observance. And I wanted to show in part what those conclusions can demonstrate. Now, just to show you the misrepresentation of historiography, I want you to see the following uh, uh, partial bibliography. In yellow, what you can see are those researches that even include oral testimonies, which means the rest of the researches, what they focus on is those two or three or 1% of formal rabbinical resources, and only a fraction of resources address what actually the majority of the people said, understood, did in those realities as, as it is seen in the oral testimonies. The, the conclusions reached by most of the researchers, like well, why did they still uh, uh, keep a form of religious ritual despite sometimes lack of belief or conditions, etc. So generally the trajectory you see of what role does Jewish observance serve in that situation of camp life, which is degrading and dehumanizing, the role it serves. Ben Zimra says to survive, to create a sense of self. Yafeliach, which we'll address later, 
uh, um, she explains it as if it creates a form of, 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 of separate space wherein the subject can feel himself again, can, can, can have a form of continuity. Avichai Tzur discusses that it's a form of expression, defiance, struggle for normality. What we see as, as a spectrum of these ideas is that, that they generally see Jewish observance as an act in those camps as a positive thing. It's something that helps survival, something that creates some sort of separation from that dehumanization process. And also the way it's understood, the way it's, it's described in a glorified way many times, generally positive, it demonstrates individuality. And in order for us to actually address the paradigm or this paradigmatic thinking, I want to introduce a text written by Professor Yafan Yach, which is one of the only researchers actually analyzing concentration camp prisoners and embedding oral testimonies or more accurately testimonies of informal figures into their accounts. And I want to unpack this paradigm. So why did they do what they were doing? Why did they uh, uh, um, have a tendency in some, case, in some cases to maintain a form of ritual, to light a Hanukkah candles, to do Passover, all of those things. What was the reasoning behind? She explains the following. She begins with the background. Many of the prisoners had lost their family members and friends. The individual drowned deeper and deeper into the abyss, stripped of it all. His family, friends, and even his own body fell prey to disease and hunger. In other words, she accepts the fact that the conditions of the camp deprive the self from being a self, dropped de deeper and deeper into the abyss. This most researchers agree on, on the fact that dehumanization is not only what the Nazis do, it's a process these survivors, victims, concentration camp prisoners undergo. And, and she continues, in the massive Nazi system, system of concentration camps, Jews designate and sanctify these few moments, separating them from the twisted reality around them. It creates a separation. We see that act, the religious act creates sort of a separate sphere. That's how she understands it. That helped them to hold on to their lives before the war and relate to their future continuity of, of, of existence where, where the self is fragmented. This provides the idea of hope. The word hope is imperative because we will later check whether that word actually appears in oral testimonies, whether the uh, uh, um, testimonies display that word or not. Hope that even Jewish modern slaves imprisoned Nazi camps will hear the arrival of the Messiah. She uses a Jewish myth of redemption, whereas there's a curve. The curve shows that in these horrible times, they will evolve to better times. That's a curve she wants to demonstrate through the story, continuity curve. Practicing Jewish observance and keeping the mitzvot displayed their strong will to declare their Judaism and humanity facing Nazi vulgarity. Prisoners' traditional observance demonstrates the spirit of Judaism that does not submit to the conditions, separation. It creates a different spare, sphere. Maintaining the tradition, I continue to follow uh, the line after this, even for a few moments, created a separate sphere of holiness in the horrific reality of concentration camps. She goes on saying, it provides a link, as you can see between past and future, Jewish continuity. And the last thing I want you to notice is how she compares it to the ancient Israelites in Egypt. The, the way she compares it, she says the same way the Israelites overcame Pharaoh, the Maccabees overcame their oppressors, we will also overcome the Nazis. So if we break down the argument, which you could see are the following uh, elements. Stage one and two, extreme in human conditions leading to a decline of self. Usually researchers agree on that. Stage three, an attempt to ascertain a sense of identity and self, how? Through cultural activity in general, specifically here through a religious awareness. So how does it work? Stage six and seven, the religious acts creates a separation. That separation gives a form of identity or at the same time, religious observance, pro, uh, uh, observance had, had a positive effect in the camps. It helped prisoners have a sense of self providing, the, providing them with an external reference point. So it's positive, it's negated to camp life and it has continuity. So if we sum it all up, we can see the following. The resources used in historiography, this is a summing up session from all of what we've, we've seen up until now, so we can continue on and, and, and observe to what degree can we see this paradigm in actually in the testimonies and what do the testimonies tell us that the paradigm does not. So let's 
but with resources, resources focused on formal, mainly rabbinical story collections, etc. hardly any oral testimonies, hardly any testimonies of women, the methodology is usually glorification, more uh, a her approach that tries to harmonize the text rather than to see the gaps therein. The common topics focus on elites, you could see by focusing on responsive literature, heroism, religion in the ghettos where the system still existed, and theory, which is most important uh, for a next, the next uh, testimony, the continuity paradigm, past, future, the continuity of self, etc., the search of the divine. The religious act is negated to camp conditions and it serves as a positive element for camp prisoners. That sums up the main trajectory of histori current historiography. That being said, all I want you to do next, after this long introduction, is listen to the following testimony. And I want you to see to what degree does the continuity paradigm hold when we listen to this, to Elno Abelitz. And furthermore, how can we understand what he says? Which role does spirituality serves for this individual? In the following testimony, I want you to notice two parts. The first, is where Erno discusses his brother, and the second he discusses himself. He's asked about his religious observance in the camps, and I want you to notice and negate both parts of the answer. And to what degree does it fit with what we've just talked about, the continuity paradigm? My brother had a mazor, Jewish the whole brand. And we had that film, one, one set of film we had in the camp, and we put on film every day. Whenever, not, I wouldn't say all the time, but while we, we had access to that pair of film, there was, there was queuing up from the early morning till, till late. And everybody just had to put on the hand film and on the, the hand film and just had to say the first, uh, first chapter of Shema and the next one. And we were queuing up hundreds of people for that pair of film. And what else did you do to maintain your, your Jewish identity? Well, I don't have to do a lot of Jewish identity as such, because we were Jew, we were sure. Jew. But I mean, why am I? Jewish life. Jewish life. I, I, Jewish life. I mean, I, I, I was eating whatever, whatever was provided. I, I, and, and sometimes, sometimes, you know, in the evening with the bread, occasionally you had, you had a bit of, bit of piece of salami or, or something. My brother didn't eat it, but I, 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 I ate it. I, I thought I didn't have to. Well, it's the most important. I realized that we are, we are not exceptional, exceptional times, and, and the main aim in life now is to survive, and anything else will be subordinate to that. And to be surviving, not only, not only, not only forget about Jewish practice, but also forget about that you are a human being. Anything, anything which, which matters in life. If you, if you start thinking what you are, what happened, then you will just go and electrocute yourself to the, to the electric wire. But I thought I mustn't think about it. I just has to behave like an animal, just, just survival. Survival to avoid being, being uh, beaten up, avoid, try to get as much food like, uh, as, as you can, and just survival. And everything spiritual comes if you manage to survive. And I had, I had some great doubts about it. At the end of the day, I, I will survive, even, even after when I survived the selections. I would like to pose a question. Within that testimony, he says, if I would think of anything spiritual, I would electrocute or go to the uh, barbed wire and electrocute myself. Why is that? Why would thinking of something spiritual or confronting that be so dangerous? Now, the thing in this testimony, the first thing that one could notice is that for Elno Abelitz, spirituality, the search for the divine, thinking of any, anything spiritual, not only isn't it as a positive tool, it's a dangerous one. It might remind you of what normal life looks like. It might create an impossible gap in your psyche. There are many reasons why he's saying what he's saying, but one thing which we can absolutely notice, which is different than Yafeliach's argument, is the fact that not always is Jewish observance served as a positive tool. Furthermore, 
it didn't serve as a singular tool because he mentioned his brother for him it was good to wait on the line for tefillin and for him he didn't eat it but Erno Abelet says for, for Erno Abelet it was a fundamentally different experience for him spirituality in a way was dangerous however in the following testimony he explains exactly why uh, and that uh, relationship to anything beyond his reality can actually be counterproductive as far as his survival chances. And in the following testimony, I want you to notice, again, three parts. There are three parts to the testimony. He talks about how important religion is. Thereafter, he talks about his experience in the camp, and then he talks about prayer for about 10 seconds. And the most part of the most interesting thing about this specific testimony is how complex it is, because none of these parts actually perfectly fit with the other part. So be sensitive to all three parts, and then we'll discuss it. When you look back over all that you've been through in your experience, what is there a message that you feel that you want to, to hand on to your children and grandchildren? Very, very, very difficult. Not, not being, a, not being a, an ideologist, just an ordinary person. All, all what I can tell them, we are very, very staunch to our religion, and uh, with all the difficulties, we manage, I, 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 I feel that everybody has survived is a victory over Nazism, over Hitler, as a victory for the Jewish nation and for the Jewish faith. And if, we, if we if we don't keep to our faith, then end of the day is the victories again Hitler, and not us. And this is very important. And I try to bring them up the children. They should be loyal to to to, to the Jewish uh, beliefs and practice. And uh, thank God, I'm very successful. Children are all wonderful children. Did, did, was your faith and at any time? Uh, quite honestly, while I was in Auschwitz, the only way you could survive is that you don't think of faith and God and anything. Don't think of anything spiritual. Just think of yourself as an animal, and your duty is not to be taken to the slaughterhouse and to get as much food as you can. And you don't think about this thing. If you start thinking about it, then you then then you are lost. If you look in around, what happens? What happens here to us? Uh, then the conclusion would be not favorable for survival. So I, was, I made a conscious effort at that time, which I think it was the right decision, not to think of anything spiritual. Though, though occasionally when I felt desperate, I prayed to God to help me. One of the things that uh, I found very interesting about this testimony, which indeed surprised me and made, made me sensitive to noticing in other testimonies, is strategy planning. He made a conscious decision. He, he knew that spirituality or, or believing in something would, might be dangerous, might remind him of hope. If you think about anything spiritual, he says, you are lost. The gap is too great. The conditions negated. Spirituality not always serves as a positive tool. It is a relevant tool to some situations. And to some situations, as he says, it is counterproductive. The other thing that I wanted to show you is another testimony. And what we will be beginning to see today is how diverse these testimonies are. If I have to say one thing about the search for the divine, it's a very diverse search. Every one of these camp prisoners has a different interpretation of what it means and which role does it serve. We indeed see some common patterns. However, one of the most uh, um, noticeable things that we could see is how every prisoner has his interpretation for what spirituality means and how a generic understanding is less and less relevant. And the following testimony is abs the absolute opposite from Erno Abelitz, but also similar in a way. This is Nelly Kochva, and she's discussing her experience of uh, reading out of a prayer book, but she's reading out the wrong prayer. So how does it work? אני קראתי מהסידור התפילה והם אמרו אחריי. 
עכשיו, זה בוודאי שלא כך מתפללים, אבל מה זה היה משנה? לי זה לא אמר כלום. העיקר שיחשבו שזה עוזר להם. אז שיתפללו כך, מה זה משנה? מה זה היה משנה לי שהתפללתי איתם בערב מה טוב הוא, או אני יודעת מאיזה תפילה עד מתי, העיקר שיאמינו שזה עוזר. רק אני מדברים, ביום כיפור זה באמת, השתדלנו מה שרק אפשרי, דומה לזה, להתפלל. זה באמת עזר הרבה. כי הבכי עוזר, וביום כיפור הצליחו לבכות הרבה. כל מי שהצליח לבכות, אגר כוח, זה היה לי חשוב מאוד. There are actually two arguments. The first, she says that she's praying from a prayer book and she's praying the wrong prayer, but it didn't matter because what mattered to her was the fact that prayer as such provides hope to others. And by providing hope to others, she feels better. And she understands that the spiritual tool is a, is a relative one, is a instrumental one. As furthermore, the second part of the testimony, she says, we try to make the Yom Kippur, which is an important holiday, the same way it was back home. But she says the reason is different. The reason for her trying to do it is so people could cry. And in another point in her testimony, she says crying was like a vitamin. Whoever cried, had better chances of survival. Now, this is the absolute opposite to Erno Abelis. Erno Abelis says, if you face your conditions, if you see your reality, if you notice that gap, you're lost. She says, no, if you avoid it, you're lost. If you're able to express, if you're able to cry, if you're able to use spirituality in order to actually be able to cry, then, then that can help you survive. Expressing your conditions, expressing the horrors of them gives you a chance of survival. However, they both agree on the fact that the spiritual tool, the, the Jewish observance, the prayer, those practices are instrumental and operate differently. Um, the next testimony has to do with another aspect of the story. Up until now, we discussed the fact that indeed, Jewish observance was seen as a positive instrument of survival. However, the testimonies show diversity, it shows that it was an instrumental tool, at times effective, and at times not only ineffective, as Elna Abelet says, dangerous. Now we'll address whether this act was considered a separate act from camp life or were camp conditions embedded into the religious act itself. And I want you to see how Rina Fratkin describes her experience in Passover in the camp. The first part of the testimony, if we go back to Yafa Eliyach's paradigm, she says the prisoners saw themselves as the descendants of the slaves in Egypt. But notice what Rina Fratkin says. She says that she compares between the situation of the Jews in the camps and between the Egyptians, not the Israelites. She says the same plagues that had come upon them had come upon us. She used, she revises the myth of, of the slaves, of the Israelite slaves, the Hebrews leaving Egypt, and, and she uses a reference point actually to display 
her being on the other side, her being an Egyptian, her being the one that God inflicts upon pain. N not only that, at the end, she mentions the fact that there's a re religious object called a maro, a bitter fruit. You're supposed to use that on Lelah Seder. She had that, but she decided not to use it, not to put it on the table because her reality, we didn't have to put it on the table, she said because the reality was that of bitter fruit, of bitter root. The reality was bitter. There was no need to put it on the table. In other words, what you see from this testimony is that the conditions of the camp affect the practice, the fact that she doesn't put the bitter root, the atmosphere of the camp, the table itself, the reality is that. And the second is the reconceptualization of, of Jewish myths, wherein she sees herself as part of the ones being plagued by God, rather part of the ones being saved by God. So camp spirituality and sanctification of camp object were part of the religious practice. Not always were positive things implemented into the practice, also negative. One more example of, of how camp objects and survival were part of the conditions, therefore part of the religious act, can be seen in the testimony of Leah Zonenshine. This too is about Passover. However, here she does not discuss the Seder or the Haggadah reading. She discusses bread and matzah, and should one bless on the bread, which is forbidden on that holiday, or should he bless only the matzah, which is allowed on that holiday? The question is not why uh, uh, they eat bread. They eat bread that makes sense. They eat bread because it's survival and there's an obligation to survive. However, the question is, uh, why does he bless the bread? And why does he insist on blessing the bread? That is, one shouldn't have a blessing over something he's not permitted to do only in cases of life-threatening situations like eating bread on Passover. So why does he bless the bread? He blesses the bread because there is sanctification of survival. The bread represents that. Although in traditional Jewish thought, you don't make a blessing on survival in that context, the camp conditions also affected what is to be sanctified. The same way before we've seen Rina Fratkin sanctify the room, the table, make it as part of the ceremony here, she sanctifies, or the rabbi actually sanctifies the bread. So in other words, we see that not always was the tool a positive tool. And furthermore, camp conditions were not separate from the actual practice, nor were they separate from the perception of the religious act. The next testimony demonstrates another layer of who was God that they approach. What were the perception of that entity which they're corresponding with? And the following testimony of Blue Mephanti will show what is the reasoning behind the religious act? What is the reasoning behind her praying or looking for a sidul or uh, conducting? Is that motivation due to a form of feeling of commitment, a religious commitment, or does it have to do with something else? 
She mentions the fact that she acquired a Sidur. She says she was very happy acquiring, being able to have a Sidur in the camps. She was happy to pay for it. She was happy to eat less that day. But why? What is her reasoning? She says at the beginning, God didn't ask it from us. He shouldn't have. He was minding his own business. So the first thing one could notice here that when she says the words he was minding his own business, she's addressing a God that indeed exists, but doesn't create obligations. He doesn't form up, he has no right to create obligations. This is a very different form of understanding the divine from the religious way where God is one that demands that you to follow the mitzvot. She understands that in this reality, it's different. Furthermore, her motivation doesn't come from above. It comes from her subjective interpretation. She says that we were happy that we had a Sidhu. And in a way, these trends of thought, if you look later to theologians as Rubenstein, the idea of a hidden God that appears therein also appears in the testimony of Blume Efrati. Furthermore, Blume Efrati addresses a very important topic. Where does the feeling or the reality of something spiritual come from in the camps? He didn't ask it from us. We were happy we got a Siddur. The idea of spirituality coming from a spe specific junction of interpretation is also what John Marie says when he says the fact that spirituality lost its accountability, its responsibility in those camps. It didn't really exist unless you created it. And in these very simple terms, the way she describes it, she describes a very similar tendency, wherein the spiritual is not exactly divine, it's a subjective divine. God is not one that has his eyes over everything and, and cares over all of his being, but it's, it's somewhat the God looking away. And she takes over the responsibility over her specific divine, over her sidu, and she does it not because he asked, because it carries meaning for her. The next testimony I want to address also has to do with a similar tendency, and it's a testimony of Salomon Kalebach. In this testimony, what he addresses is how did the religious act look like? And I want you to know something very important about the following testimony, which, which will also sum up all of what we've argued and also direct uh, our, our conclusions. And I want you to notice that here he doesn't only address how the religious act looks like, he also relates to something that the interviewer asks. He relates to some kind of assumption the interviewer has. And he tries to restructure that assumption. I want you to notice that as well, and I'll address it after. He's actually answering questions about religious observance, but he also tries to explain the setting in which this religious observance occurred in Auschwitz. Let's go back a bit. And this is Salomon Kalibach talking about the profile of the religious act. 
it's interesting since he says none of that took place over there. There were no heroic thoughts, but, but the thing is that in the same testimony, at the beginning of it, he actually mentions his father standing on the table, lighting the Hanukkah candles, having kids around him, everyone's inspired by it. It's a heroic act, he endangered himself. So why is he saying none of that took place over there? Why is he saying, what is he addressing when he says there were no tearful prayers in the middle of the night? I think part of what he's trying to say is that the majority of the religious acts in the camps weren't acts of heroism, were meager, were small, were fitting the reality which they can deal with. Camp conditions were not separate to the way they experienced religion, to the way they experienced the divine. It was part of how they experienced it as a smaller one, as a weaker one, as not even, when he says uh, that no one got up in the middle of the night to have a tearful prayer, because here, tears were a commodity which were rare there, as Alman Gardovsky said. People had trouble crying. As you noticed before, whoever cried had a better chance of survival. That was, crying wasn't an easy thing to do there because it was linked to emotions. What he's trying to say in other words, when he says none of that took place, he's trying the way I see it, to undermine the generalization of how religious Jews react and showing that of many of them, their religious act weren't heroic in their eyes, were small, were meager, were relevant to the conditions and were to the, to the degree which they could deal with them conceptually and technically. And in order to sum up, but, but, but we're missing actually one more testimony which I want to present. The testimony we're missing and should have been brought first is actually a testimony showing of what the majority of these religious uh, um, Jewish camp prisoners had, which was actually nothing. And for that, I would like to show you one of the following testimonies here. If you will stay with me. Here we go. The following testimonies of Ernst Deitch, and he is asked about his Jewish observance during his life in Auschwitz and also immediately after. And one of the things, oh, this is just audio. So um, we will skip that and I will say what he mentions in his testimony and that is as follows. Ernst Deutsch says that after the war, he had nothing. He had no tefillin. He had no way of having religion. It took him a few years just to have the conditions to re-embrace his traditional religious practice. In other words, many times we don't discuss actual conditions for religion. And for some people, the conditions are imperative. And for him to return to his Jewish observance, he needed those conditions, whether they're a prayer book, a tefillin. Many of these people don't know the prayers by heart and their connection is via the, the, the institute, the religious institute or the synagogue. And for many people when that didn't exist, so the relationship was very different than what they were used to. Now, that being said, I, want, I wish to share with you the following chart, which demonstrates the process with, processes we, which we have just discussed. Here we go. This is the one. So when we sh look at the role of spirituality in the camp, what I'm gonna try noticing with you is the spectrum of each of these answers and how it fits or doesn't fit to the continuity paradigm. And what do we see from these testimonies in general? So role of spirituality in the camps, we see Deitch, Rubin, which is another testimony, it's little to none. A negative role of spirituality, we mentioned Abalet, an instrumental meaning it carries no meaning only by it providing or hope or expression. We see the testimonies of Fratin Kochba, survival. Kalibach in another part of his testimony shows that the religious act creates hope. But what I want you to notice is that the idea of hope regarding the role of spirituality, regarding the role of how they saw the religious act is not the central idea. It's just one out of five different uh, camp prisoners. Same goes for the profile of the religious act. In some cases, it, it, it is glorified, but mainly it's not. Ekali Bach mentioned circumstances. Uh, Fratkin and Zonestein introduced camp conditions to the act. The Fratkin and Kochva have a subjective meaning, 
and some downplay the act as uh, um, Diet Chauvin and Abelitz do. That leads us to the fact that what we notice more than anything is the third aspect, forms of adaptation. We see that these different camp prisoners had adapted their religious understanding to their conditions and worked with what they had. And the adaptation of Abelitz was to deglorify the act or of Karlebach that have two sides of it, a deglorified one and one that, that sees his father as, as someone that gives hope to people. So he has an ambivalent approach. Some see the act as empty, just carrying other meaning, symbolic and expression. Perception of God also changes as we see, and there's more expression of disappointment. In general, what we can see from these patterns are the following common patterns. One is a diverse meaning. Unlike the formal testimonies, these oral testimonies display in almost every case a different version. There are generalizing general patterns we can see, but one of those patterns is actually diversity. Two, we could see deglorification of the act. That's many uh, prayers, for example, do not discuss the will to be saved, but rather the will to die. There's a revision, and I wouldn't even say deglorification, but, but restructuring of how they understand the religious act. There's a break in continuity. Prayers demonstrated more than anything. People there, not everyone, but many of them describe that their time prayers were shortened because the hope that they could hope for was shortened. They would think in 12 hour periods, continue on survival oriented. Almost every one of these testimonies is survival oriented, has a revision of the search, has a subjective meaning to the search, is connected to the camp reality, has some form of whether it be the negativity of the camp or the actual camp object, etc. There's time, space, object, the decline of hope. We notice that very strongly in the prayers, many of them mentioned we had no hope, we had prayer, or we had no hope, we had something else. Um, symbolization of the event, the event doesn't carry any essential meaning, not God ordained, this subjective one, and bottom up spiritual strategy. Those are the things that can be seen from the oral testimonies that um, do not appear in the written one. Now, one of the things that I wanted to explain is why, why did these researches miss out on such a wonderful uh, a tool and that expands the topic of what it means to be uh, an observant Jew or, or what, is, what does it mean to, to practice uh, observant Judaism in the, under those conditions? Why was that only focused on formal texts? And the reasons are, as I mentioned um, before, how is the oral, uh, the first part is how are oral informal testimonies marginalized? I mentioned the resources they use, and that's what we discussed, whether it's a focus on formal text, rabbinical elite, lack of oral history, et cetera. But the reason is, there are several different reasons. The first is usually the material at hand researchers use, the first hand material were response to literature and story collections. That was the first published material. And that's what the early researchers based their perception on. Secondly, uh, um, much of this research was conducted by observant Jews, which had an influence on how they wrote it. Three, the general inclination of early Holocaust studies focused on the elite. This is not only true regarding observant Jews. This is true regarding researches dealing with Nazi propaganda and researches dealing with, with Jewish elite, usually um, analyzing a very thin line of uh, 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 figures that are considered elite rather than understanding the social dynamics or broader groups of population. Number four is ideas that display Jewish observance as a form of rebellion became more common. In the shift of the 60s and 70s towards seeing survivors and victims as, as their cultural activities, acts of heroism, Jewish observance was branded as such, was seen as a positive thing, and therefore that's what they looked for in text. Rabbis had a responsibility to make sense of their reality. Who's editing those story collections? Rabbis. And those rabbis, when they choose the stories they want to present forward, they would rather choose stories of hope and sustaining of Jewish tradition, et cetera, rather than questioning it. And therefore, those are the stories we meet. And the written, that's a methodological thing that's general in these studies. Usually researchers prefer the written than the, 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 uh, um, the oral testimony. It's easier to analyze. It has it's easier to unpack. You don't have to address gestures, uh, forms of ambivalence. You could, but 
it is more complex to analyze oral testimonies and that's why the more immediate tool is the written one. In our case, the written one is also the formal one. So that's the reasons why it was redirected. But I also wanted to show you what are the benefits we can have when we present these oral testimonies, how they expand the way we understand what Jewish observance means. And I will end with this. In these testimonies, as I have shown, interpretation, context, and the role of the religious act are given decisive weight. Elno Abeles explains how religious observance in the camp was ill-suited to his situation. Accordingly, he avoids and objects to it. Rabbi Kalebach, Efrati, Kochva, and others, in contrast, invest this act with new meanings, one directly associated with the conditions of camp life as part of Nazi oppression apparatus. Thus, the conditions were crucial in shaping religious activity or its avoidance. Furthermore, they caused the inmates to revisit the role of religion for themselves personally. Few did what they did in an attempt to sanctify something sublime. Instead, their aim was to create sublimity relative to their situation. In other words, their consideration, as expressed overtly in their testimonies, relate not to the preservation, preserving the faith, but to considerations of survival and normalcy. And I want to end with actually a story. I've presented this uh, um, lecture to many, many different groups. I've presented it to Christian leaders. I've presented it to, to uh, uh, priests, to rabbis, Reform, Orthodox, and Conservative, and to Chabad campus leaders. And one of the most interesting responses I had came actually from one of the Chabad uh, um, campus leaders. He says, thank you. I asked him, what are you thanking me for? He says, because usually when, when, when they taught me these religious heroic stories, they presented always heroism as an act that I can't fully understand of this rabbi that no matter what kept his religion. And suddenly it makes sense. And I think this has to do with the fact that this research doesn't only say something about the Holocaust. It doesn't only say something about the methodology of oral testimonies or theology. It also says something about that aspect of human behavior, which is the search of the, for the divine, that aspect that is a flexible one, that is something that is very human, and actually analyzing that as a trait of human behavior through this case study can help us also understand religion, but also understand human behavior. Thank you very much.